Well, welcome. Thank all of you for being here. For those of you that are Dell fans, a shorter introduction would have been, hello, it's me. I, as Jeff mentioned, one of the great uh, honors in my career was when I received the Schumann Weil Award from the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And you'll notice here in this shot, it was actually given to me by Dr. Weil and the founding president of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And his comments were so kind when he gave me this award because he talked about the history of SCCM and how as a founding president, he had always envisioned it being an interdisciplinary, interprofessional society, and that it gave him pleasure to actually be giving me that award as, the, as again, the first pharmacist to receive it. And so, you know, in hindsight now, in memoriam to Dr. Weil, I, again, feel very honored to, to have received that. And, and now to be, uh, have the honor of giving this plenary session is, is I guess, one more, uh, let's say this is more of a landmark for pharmacists. I have a number of colleagues in the audience that uh, are, in my mind, they're probably more deserving of this. Some of my uh, USIT colleagues, as an example, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Perrin Cobb, who is, you know, founder of that organization, Dr. Chuck Cairns, who's my current dean at the institution I'm at and current director of that. Again, a lot of very deserving folks out there, but I, I guess I feel like I'm sort of representing pharmacy when I accept this award. So, so thanks to uh, whoever it was that got me into this position. All right, well, I thought I'd start by finding out a little bit about you, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So which of the following movie titles is most reflective of your current position? It's a Wonderful Life, Vertigo, No Country for Old Men, I'd probably be in that category, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, or Fight Club, or Apocalypse Now. Let's hope it's none of those. All right, now I've got a question. We'll see how well you know me. Which of the following statements is true about me based on the general principles? We've got to have evidence-based medicine involved in this talk, based on evidence-based medicine. I was born and raised in a city that had a population greater than one million. I played on a tennis team at a top-tier university and won the conference title. I'm a board-certified critical care pharmacist per the Board of Pharmacy Specialties. I'm a founding member of the Department of the Homeland Security of the United States. Now, which one do you know is absolutely wrong? It's D, correct? You can throw D out. So start narrowing them down. You say D's got to be incorrect. And then I had a, a friend that I was showing this slide to, and he says, well, I know that A is incorrect because South Dakota, he knew I was from South Dakota, South Dakota doesn't have any cities that got more than a million people. So he knew that was wrong. Well, let's go through and see. Well, first for my students, I actually was born and I was a child. Students don't, you know, they think of us, they see me, my balding head, and they don't believe I was ever a child, but I was born in a small town in South Dakota. So not a big city small town in uh, South Dakota. It was actually very large for South Dakota, 5,000 people, but small otherwise. I was on a tennis team, and we, in fact, did win the conference championship, but it was not a top tier. This was in the NAIA uh, conference at the time, but we did tie for first place in the, in the conference. First time it ever happened, and to digress a little, we had a coach who knew absolutely nothing about tennis, and he would go fishing while we played our matches. And every time he would come and pick us up when the match was done, he'd always make the same statement, good job, boys, let's go get something to eat. So this time he came back from his fishing trip and said, coach, we won the conference title first time in the history of our college. Good job, boys, let's go get something to eat. And so no ego involved there. He's very consistent. Well... I'm actually not a board-certified critical care pharmacist, but there's a reason for that. I was actually chair of the council of the Board of Pharmacy Specialties that was creating the first exam so we would have board-certified critical care pharmacists. So being the person that was involved in writing that exam and administering it, uh, I was not allowed actually to take the exam. I won't be able to take that now for a couple of years. Um, so. I was, again, chair of the council that led the efforts uh, for, the, for the critical care specialization, but um, not able to take it. But we do have a number of folks in this audience, including a past president of this society, who is now a board-certified critical care pharmacist. 
Well, what about that founding member of Homeland Security? I want you to read. I'll read this fine print for those that are in the back and you can't. Be it known, Brian Erstead is a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security dedicated to preventing terrorist attacks within the United States, reducing America's vulnerability to terrorism, and minimizing the damage from potential attacks and natural disasters, and it's signed by Tom Ridge. I, I have no idea. I have some idea how I might have got this. This is not rigged. This actually is a certificate I got. All I can trace it back to is I was one of the first folks after 9-11 to respond and become part of a disaster medical assistance team, a DMAT. And all I can think is because I was one of the first person to fill out the thousand pages of government forms and volunteer for that, that somehow I ended up with this. But this literally is a certificate I have in my office. At one point, I thought my wife had thrown it away, and I was sort of panicking because I thought no one is ever going to believe this. i got to have a, the actual certificate. I'll let you decide so if that one was true or not. All right, well, here's my caveat to the talk. It is US-centric, and knowing that Society of Critical Care Medicine is not only a, an interprofessional organization, but we have colleagues from around the world, I feel bad not giving more of an international perspective, but obviously what I know best is the US, the US healthcare system. And I'm going to give, you'll notice, quite a critique of our, our system, and at times it'll maybe seem a little too harsh. So I thought I'd better put up at least one slide where I talk about some of the things that show that there are some very valuable aspects to our system, and one of which, as you know, in quotes here I have on this slide, that we're responsible for the vast majority of all healthcare innovations. Now, again, you can argue these points for my international colleagues. But this is, you know, there are at least some folks out there saying these kinds of things that there are advantages to our system. But I, as I go through with, again, some of my critique, I thought it's best I try to at least give some balance to this, this talk. Well, the talk, I'm going to speak on value-based medicine. And so we have any, just like with any debate, we need to start off with a definition. And the most basic definition, there are a variety, are health, come do, health outcomes achieved per dollar spent. And by no means is this a simple uh, calculation, especially if you take into account all the things we should take into account. It must be defined from the context of the individual patient. The outcomes are multidimensional. You can't just look at one thing. The cost should really include all costs of the cycle of, of care and not compartmentalized. In other words, it's not just a silo. It's not for pharmacists in pharmacy, the drug budget, and you need to keep the drug budget under control. That would be an example of the wrong way to look at it. And then you need to look at this value over long term. It can't just be, did you just get them out of the hospital in a week, but then they you know, have, for the next five years, they have a terrible quality of life. It's really the long term picture. And so when you see this slide and you see the things that go into this, then I guess I would turn it around and say to you, how many feel like you're in a place where they do really value the long-term perspective, where they, they're not siloed. It's not just about making money in the short term. And I'll just let you ponder that. And I suspect many of you would probably feel like you're not necessarily in that institution. Well, I'm going to start off with external drivers, what I consider things that are beyond your control when it comes to value-based medicine. And then I'll get down more to the local level as I progress through my talk. So these are some of the things that are just kind of scary because we can't do a lot about. In the U.S., our healthcare expenditures are approaching $3 trillion a year, one of every $6 of the GDP. A third of the population receives the majority of the care through the government, through some type of government program. The healthcare expenditures are projected to increase more than the GDP is expected to increase. So unless we do make some dramatic changes, that's going the wrong direction. And there's this shift from sort of pharmaceuticals to biotechnology products that are definitely more expensive to produce. It's been estimated it's an average of a billion dollars to produce some of these, these uh, products. But there's a lot of potential benefits. This is where we get into the potential for real precision medicine. And from, but from a company standpoint, realize it's, you know, you can potentially get some very large return on investments, but in a very volatile market and, and you have a lot of products that may never well make it to the market. So all that has to be taken into account. Well, this slide is a little difficult to read, but I'll tell you the sort of the major point of it. And that's that when you looked in terms of the overall ranking of 11 uh, uh, countries uh, or, uh, um, or some number, I'm having trouble seeing the exact number, but of these countries that are up there, 
in terms of quality of care, the United States basically ended up ranking last overall, and yet in the bottom right, we are the most expensive in terms of the costs of care. And so we do have a ways to go in terms of the United States when our quality of care is at the lowest, and yet we're most expensive uh, care in the world. A lot of shifting going on in terms of the healthcare system itself in a, in a larger sense. And this has directly affected me and I put up a, a trademark to show you how it's directly affected me. Our, our two hospitals recently, we actually man, merged with Banner. And so we were one of these academic medical centers that this person is talking about, Bob Herman is talking about in modern healthcare when he was referring to these academic d dinosaurs that were becoming titans. We were having a very difficult time as a hospital, you know, a sort of a standalone academic medical center hospital surviving. Uh, some changes had to be made and the decision was made that we were going to merge with Banner and we're still in the throes of that merger. Parts of it are sort of behind us now, but I'm actually in the midst of dealing with, with, with some of the effects of this. I'd like to think that four or five years from now, I'll be standing up and it's something similar to this and I'll be talking about all the good things that have happened and the wonderful things we've done with this merger. But for right now, I can just say this kind of thing is a reality in order for, you know, for academic centers to survive. We end up having to make certain kinds of changes. And along with this, there's the organizations, uh, many are becoming much more uh, accountable, and that's where this word, the accountable care organizations comes from, that basically they're assuming more risk than this traditional fee-for-service model. So, you know, we are converting away from that traditional fee-for-service model. All right, what about the impact of pharmaceuticals on medication expenditures? And I say most of this is beyond your control. Well, this is just to show you that there are some disparities out there. So in this case, I can talk a little bit more in terms of an international perspective, in the sense that the high income, 16% of the world's population, they account for 78.5% of the total pharmaceutical expenditures. So clearly there's some potential disparities going on when you see those kinds of, of figures. This shift from so-called small molecules, drugs, to these biologics, these biotechnologies is, you know, I have this listed as the future, but actually it's not even the future, it's reality. And you'll see that in a minute when I show some of the products that have been approved recently. So really the past was all about small molecules. And as one of my basic science guys would say, playing with small molecules. We had generics available that would, it helped control prices. We had legislation uh, involved. And you look, these, um, you know, there were some of these drugs that again, made, made quite a bit of money. But now suddenly we're having these biologics and they present all kinds of challenges in terms of you know, really generic isn't even the terminology we're using anymore. Now we're using terms like biosimilar or interchangeable. And, the, and uh, so it's even a whole different set of terminology and definitions when it comes to these. And, and the United States is still really wrestling with how to handle these. Some other countries, uh, Great Britain, have done a, a better job in terms of the numbers of these products they've got on the market, potential substitutions, but it's, a, it's a really a, a challenge. And so it's a challenge for the industry, it's a challenge for the healthcare system as a whole. Well, you can see there's a number of novel new drugs there that have been both approved and applications have been filed. It's, it's increased over the years. There's, they've been approved under it for in different ways. So you look, some of these were fast-tracked, some were labeled as breakthrough. Most of them that were approved were under this category of priority, re priority review. And then there were some that were listed as accelerated approval. But they, so they got to market under a, a variety of different mechanisms. Well, this slide, I think, gives you an example of the kinds of, of issues we're dealing with and where we get into this no country for old men. These were just some of the so-called MAB approvals. These aren't all of the new drug entities in 2015. These were just ones that had MAB at the end of their name. And you look through that, and for some of you that have been around quite a while, and your eyes kind of glaze over when you see these agents. Um, we have w one in there that you can see where we clearly have some ap direct application for critical care, but a lot of these have been in the oncology area, et cetera. But I guarantee we're only going to see more of these kinds of drugs in the uh, critical care setting. And finally, I had to somehow, I've got to actually get a patient in here 
and, and really show how this directly relates to a patient. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. And in this case, I'm going to use it to illustrate the good and the bad parts of our healthcare system. And this patient, and the way I can get away with showing this picture is because it's a photo of my son. My son, at an early age, was diagnosed with a combination of Crohn's disease and ankylosing spondylitis. And very early on, I was, keep, as you could imagine, as a concerned parent, trying to keep up very well with this literature, and decided very early on that I wanted him on one of these biologics because I was well aware that drugs like NSAIDs, et cetera, the traditional pyramid pathway, was they, those were not disease-modifying drugs. They were just basically, get, they would take care of the pain, but that would be it. And so I was, again, trying to be ahead of the curve with my son. So along with his, uh, really an internationally recognized physician, we ended up putting him on one of these therapies. And he did remarkably well. Matter of fact, his gastroenterologist to this day said he's the best patient he's had. He's never required a surgery. And so that you can look at, well, what a great uh, example of our modern healthcare system. We have a new biologic that has taken someone like this that a number of years ago would have likely had a surgery or two by now and has had no surgeries, no hospitalizations. Again, he has a great physician, a testament, again, to the physician in the audience. And yet at the same time, about a month ago, he, we get a letter in the mail. Or actually, he didn't get a letter. He got a phone call. It was just before one of his scheduled visits for his infusion because he still requires every six to eight week inf infusions of one of these biologics. And he gets a phone call, well, your visit's been canceled. You're not able to come. Well, why? Well, the physician has to complete paperwork showing that basically demonstrating that you still need the drug. He needs to do a full workup because there had been a shift in providers. And so he needs to redo all the paperwork. And until that gets done, sent in, et cetera, you just can't have your infusion. And so I'm thinking, isn't this ironic that here we have a, a, a kid who's totally and now no longer a kid, he's an adult now, by the way, uh, uh, 22 years old. But he's, here we have this, this, uh, this adult now, young adult, who's done remarkably well in one of these agents. Now the system is saying, well, you actually, for because of these bureaucratic reasons, can't even receive this drug right now. We ended up getting through it. It ended up being delayed. But it's the kind of thing that even now as an adult, you know, it, it, it scares him. So it, I just think that example really illustrates the good and bad of, of our uh, healthcare system. I'd also say as someone where I've had a good deal of research in the area of patient safety, this also allowed me to see some aspects of patient safety. At one point, he, he was given a dose or scheduled to be given a dose that was twice the dose it was supposed to be. And it was the classic Swiss cheese sort of thing that we talk about with medication errors where just a number of things happened to all ha you know, the, the holes all aligned at the same time and this error almost went through. But fortunately, I was as you could imagine, a pretty attentive person, and I caught it early on. And now I don't even have to be there for his appointments because he checks the doses himself. He's now a very informed consumer and does a lot of these things on his, on his own. And by the way, I'm proud to say, he, you know, this is another example where he just got accepted into the graduate school, Optical Science and Engineering at the University of Arizona. And so here you have someone who obviously appears to be uh, going on a track, uh, a track to be a very productive member of society. Well, imagine if his care wasn't so great and he was constant hospitalizations, he wasn't able to get this education, et cetera, it might be a much different path. So it's, I think you can make an argument that for some of these drugs, it's in a societal interest as well as a patient interest to pay some of that money and actually uh, have access to some of these. But I'll talk more about that cost issue. I will say, just for those of you just pique your interest a little, Here's an example of a drug now that's on the market that was actually an anti-seizure drug that was made by 3D technology. Now, to me, this is, again, it's more, uh, I'm not sure exactly what to make of it other than just to show you the kinds of things that are out there now. You've heard a lot about 3D technology and it's even applied to the case of uh, pharmaceuticals. All right, well, let's get a little at more at the local level and talk about something that I know is painful subject for all of you, and that's drug shortages. Well, if you look that little circle, that's, uh, that's circling my face. This was that disaster medical assistance team that I told you about that I was a member of and actually got deployed during Hurricane Ivan to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this was with actually a couple of the DMAT teams there. Uh, there was a 
long story about FEMA and everything else, and I, I feel like digressing, but I'm going to resist. But the reason I'm bringing this up is to say this was an example for me. It wasn't so much as drug shortages as drugs restrictions, but it ends up being the same sort of principle. I remember when I got off the plane, I had an emergency physician that came up to me after he had realized that he had this fairly restricted formulary, government formulary of drugs that he really wasn't familiar with and, you know, not necessarily the ones he was used to. And I remember stepping off the plane and he said, boy, am I glad to see you. And that made me feel pretty good as a pharmacist. So, but again, and I, I feel like digressing, but I'm going to resist talking about that whole, that whole sort of nightmare situation. All right. For drug shortages, this is just a partial list of the drug shortages that are related to ICU drugs. So I limited this to ICU drugs. And if you look, the numbers have increasing dramatically from 70 in 2006 to over 260 in 2013. There's some data with some changes by the FDA that this may be leveling off or decreasing. But you look at these drugs, these are not just, <laughs> you know, no big deal drugs. These are things we commonly use in the care of our patients and that are, it creates real difficulties when we have to try to switch to something else, especially drugs that that prescribing physician isn't necessarily used to. Well, what are the implications of these shortages? Well, obviously, it's not just the cost and convenience. They're real patient safety concerns. You start using drugs that you're not familiar with, and there can be issues. And here's some of the examples of actual and potential adverse drug events that, in my mind, pretty much directly related to drug shortages. You know, paralyzed a patient that, you know, wasn't uh, that uh, a paralyzed patient that not prescribed an alternative to propofol, you know, 20-fold overdoses and those kinds of things. Patient died of overdoses of epinephrine. I'll give you a good example of one near the bottom of the slide, but it's not on the slide, and that's, that's a hydromorphone. I know at one point our hospital shifted to a lot more use of hydromorphone, and we s definitely started seeing a rise in the number of hydromorphone-related adverse events. And as you could imagine, the reason was because it's six-fold more potent than morphine. So it'd be one of those things where a physician would inadvertently write an order, like for hydromorphone, four milligrams IV. The nurse says, well, I'm very used to giving morphine, four milligrams IV, no big deal. Maybe not very familiar with hydromorphone. So it gets through the system. Now, we do have electronic health records now. This is less likely to happen. But in the olden days with, with written orders, this is the kind of problem we'd run into. And it would get through the system. And obviously, if we'd have went up to the nurse or doctor at the time and said, do you realize, or would you ever give 24 milligrams of morphine IV push to an opiate naive patient? The answer would be, of course not. Well, in essence, you just did that when you gave four milligrams of hydromorphone. So anyway, when you're not used to using some of these drugs, there are implications beyond uh, cost issues. Well, are generic prices, or are generic drugs the, the uh, you know, the, the answer? I mentioned earlier, we have these generic drugs that in a small molecule age, they were clearly the answer. They did help to control prices. But guess what? Once you start having shortages, guess what some of the drugs are that are, go on shortages? Sometimes these are these uh, generic drugs, or there ends up being one generic drug, and when there's one generic drug, well, then it's backed again. There's a lot of room in terms of what that company can charge for that, even though it's a generic drug. There's no competition. Well, here's an example of the cost. These were generic drugs in 2014. Again, the public, I think, is used to thinking of generics as they're all low-cost drugs. Look at these percent increases before and after. This is, again, one year during 2014 with some various drugs. I point this out because many of you in the press recently, right, you've seen Martin Screlly, who was in front of Congress because took a drug pyrimethamine and that drug, they took it over, and they suddenly was a 5,000 percent increase, percent increase. And that was scandalous, made national news. He was hauled in front of Congress. And then now look at this slide. There are other drugs that have had, you know, very large increase in prices also. But I will say that he made what to me is the basic mistake is you don't want to draw the attention. You don't want to get in the limelight and for that kind of a reason. Um, but this raises real challenges because, in essence, there is nothing to stop a company from charging whatever for a drug other than the idea that somebody, it might get to the point where the public starts talking about it, gets in front of Congress, but is there really any teeth behind that? It's a very difficult issue, especially when it's in a unique therapeutic entity. 
again, if we have other options, if there's four other sedatives, but when you're dealing with a unique therapeutic entity, it provides real challenges when, in essence, there's no upper limit to what that price can be. All right. Well, this is one way you could get at it in the old days. This is an order that was written by one of our trauma docs, and it was a way of saving money. No albumin at all. That was a pretty straightforward <laughs> forward way of getting at it. Just avoid certain costly drugs. Now, another perspective, and I actually had heard this. I was in a group of uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, high-level physicians, folks that were involved at the national level, and I heard, and this was one of the comments in a meeting was at, I would never make a patient care decision based on drug cost, with the implication if, it was, if, it was, if anything it was unethical to even consider that. And I'll just leave that out there to say if you think that's appropriate attitude to have. I would say that you better be careful with that because while I sort of understand the premise behind it, I always come back to the kind of scenario, what if you have two options that in your own mind are basically equal in terms of efficacy, adverse events, et cetera, and one is outrageously expensive and one's not, do you really not want to know about that? Do you really not want that not to take that into account? Well, this was an interesting, it was a pro-con written debate in intensive care medicine. And it was about how we should look at cost in the ICU. And you've looked at the pro side, that we need to take cost into consideration. The person pointed out, medical resources are finite. You know, reductions by choosing drugs with similar efficacy should help. Made all these various arguments pro. Then there was the con. Well, the cost savings are small since many ICU costs are fixed. In fact, cutting these bedside costs might even raise downstream costs. Remember, value, we're looking at the bigger picture. But I'll point out one thing with, that in common with all of these, and that's the pros said we need to aim for cost effective. The cons said we need to aim for cost effective. And there was a not so sure editorial that argued for cost effectiveness. So I will talk about cost effectiveness studies later, but there sure seems to be this, this general agreement that we need to try to look at cost effective care. All right, here's one thing as a pharmacist that I don't want to be. I don't want to be pharma cop. That was in the past, at least, it seems like that was at times how some pharmacists were perceived. It was just all about trying to limit access to expensive drugs. I do not want to be pharma cop. I've never wanted to be pharma cop. I think should cost be a consideration? Yes, but it's relative to efficacy, toxicity, et cetera. Now, just so you go away, I don't want you to go away thinking that's what I really look like. And also, in reference for those of you that were here when to hear John Louis Vincent talk, where he showed some scantily clad women, I thought I better be fair, and since he showed some scantily clad women, I'm going to show a scantily clad man. So if you see me in the exercise room, this is what I really look like. <laughs> All right. Now it's time to have some fun. Now we're going to see your knowledge of how some of these drugs cost. Just a couple slides on this. Look through this list and place these antimicrobials in order from most to least costly. Obviously, I'm not going to show hands or anything else, but just in your own mind, look through and sort of tell me what you think that order would look like from most to least costly. Okay. And here it is. So some probably wouldn't surprise you. I guess you'd think, well, cephalin, you'd think, yeah, that's a, been around forever. I'd expect that to be inexpensive, and it is. But maybe that didn't, maybe some of these surprised you a little bit. Look at that sodium penicillin and the amounts that we use with some of the doses of 20 million units. That's an example. It's a drug that's been around forever. But guess what? You have a shortage or only one company making it and suddenly you can have a gigantic increase in the price of a drug that's been around forever. Which of the following antihypertensive agents is most costly based solely on drug cost? Well, you look at that, and here's the key is in 2014, guess what? The older so-called dirtier drug, nitroprusside, was the most costly. So it it is not so simple as just the older versus the newer drug. 
And ideally, we'd have a system where you're sort of prompted so you have access to some of this knowledge, but it, it changes over time. This may not be true as of this, this moment. And I had to have one in here. This is for the trauma surgeons who love to use beer. Which of the following agents for ethanol withdrawal is most costly based solely on drug cost? The beer, the lorazepam, the dex. Well, okay. Look at that. The beer was even more costly than the lorazepam. Well, the FDA, as I mentioned, they are trying to do some things about shortages. I don't expect you to read through this. It's more just to let you know the FDA it really is. Uh, they really are making attempts to try to control shortages, and they're doing a number of things that appear to have made the shortages at least somewhat level off. And there are some other things that are, are in the works now that I think should help with drug shortages. There are some things your institution can do. Ad admittedly, you just you can't control what you get in terms of if a drug's gone, it's gone. But there are some of these principles based on emergency preparedness. Back to when I was on a DMAT, I think some of these same principles apply, and that was an analogy that was actually uh, used by, the, by uh, Dr. Hick, who wrote this article for New England Journal of Medicine. All right, what about assessing the value? We've talked a lot about the cost of these. Well, now trying to assess the value, and this is something that at, at the University of Arizona, I'm actually part of our health com outcomes group. I, tr I do some of this research myself. I've in published, in some cases, uh, uh, research along these lines. So we talk about this ECHO model, economic, clinical, humanistic. The humanistic is where you're actually taking into account the patients, their subjective, uh, their input into all of this stuff. It's not just our our side from the healthcare professional, you're actually get taking into account that, that patient, which is what it should be all about. And so we, we talk about pharmacoeconomics research, and we're trying to, in essence, measuring these costs and consequences of, of these uh, pharmaceutical products and services. And you'll notice down at the bottom, I think this is a tool to augment decision making. It will not be the decision maker. This is not going to solve your problems, these kinds of studies. It's, it'll help. It'll help. But it won't, don't think it's going to make it easy or take the, the decisions away. So just to contrast a clinical trial from one of these economic trials, you know, the clinical hypothesis tested, you know, you're looking for this very homogeneous group. It's all about efficacy, safety, very controlled conditions, statistical testing. Well, pharmacoeconomics, suddenly we shift from efficacy to effectiveness, real world effectiveness considerations. It's, it's where we want the generalizability. We want to know how this applies to different groups. It's more real life. We do have an equivalent for statistical uh, significance testing, and that's through the sensitivity analysis, where we can vary all of the premises and see how it affects the ultimate cost effectiveness parameter. Two most common methods that we use clinically are cost minimization, cost effectiveness. Cost minimization, to me, there's there's not often that there's not very often there's a role for that because you either have to presume competing therapies are equivalent, both in terms of efficacy or toxicity, or you have to be able to prove it. As you know, that doesn't happen very often. Cost effectiveness is really the way to go, and there's a form of cost effectiveness called cost utility, where we base the its cost and quality adjusted life years, which in essence, back to what I said earlier, you need patient perspective to determine this. There's a variety of instruments you use where patients give their input, and then you actually look at this in terms of quality-adjusted life years. Now, there's a great deal of argument by economists, by other, uh, by health economists, in terms of what's an acceptable cost per quality. You'll hear figures like fifty dollars to $150,000. That's often cited in the literature. But I can tell you, every time you try to come up with a set number like that and say, well, ideally, we want... A, a cost per quality less than, say, 50000 or less than 150000 suddenly you're going to find an exception, something that breaks the rule. Maybe it's, again, this miraculous drug, a new therapeutic entity that's higher than that, and there's no alternative. Are you really going to deny patients access to that drug because it's higher? Or more recently, the new antihepatitis C drugs, where, in fact, they probably met, at least with some of the analysis I've seen, they met the cost quality figure of for sure less than $150,000, but 
but it still was a major challenge to the healthcare system because so many patients got it, you know, within a relatively short period of time. So it, it, in, it was a real challenge to the healthcare system because of the sheer number of people that had access to the drug. So in my mind, it's very difficult to just set a number and say that's going to be the defining way you make this decision on a, on a drug. Some countries do use pharmacoeconomics outcomes research more than we do. Uh, and I give some examples on the slide here, but I think all of us to some extent use it at the PNT committee level, uh, even in countries like the United States. All right, there are some interesting uses of outcomes research. Here is one, a cost effectiveness determination that men are not cost effective. This one is anecdotally verified for me by my wife that I'm not cost effective. Cost effective, whenever we talk about these kinds of studies, we always have to talk about perspective. Perspective is very important. Is it from the perspective of the payer, which is often the case with these published studies? Is it from the perspective of society? Some would argue that for any of these studies, you always need to have a societal perspective. And while I understand why that's appealing, I'll also point out it's very challenging. As someone who does those studies, who am I to say what the societal perspective is on neuromuscular blockade use in the ICU? in a patient who's not even with it because they're sedated and have analgesic agents on board. So how do I get the patient's input on that? So it can be very challenging. But anyway, this whole story reminds me, chicken and pig, they're passing a restaurant. They see a sign in the restaurant, it says bacon and eggs. The chicken looks at the pig and says, isn't that great? We can do our part, help society out, you know, really, really help out. And the pig looks back at the chicken and he says, well, that's fine. For you, it's a contribution but for me, it's a total commitment. All right, so we have at my place, we have something where our pharmacists get together with our trainees in, in our critical care units, emergency medicine groups. We talk about different things. We look at P&T issues coming forward. We try to deal at times with, are some of these things cost effective? And I'll actually give you an example here of recently we were considering, we are having a protocol looking at it for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. We are looking at using an alternative, find a Paranux instead of our Gatraban. And we decided, well, since we're coming up with this protocol anyway, why don't we take the part of this protocol and let's look at it and actually do a cost effectiveness analysis. And so, and that's what we did. And we're in the process now, we've actually done this analysis and now we're, we're seeking publication for it. And so we wanted to look, well, from an economic standpoint, how would this actually impact uh, the institution. So we do real this, use this in real time at the local level, these kinds of principles. And this again is just a proportion of that and what we were using in terms of performing our cost effectiveness analysis. All right, the final thing then I wanna show you is, is why we use decision trees. Part of doing these economic analyses, we deal with these complicated decision trees. And I wanna illustrate why these are useful, because it can be very difficult for the human mind to think along parallel tracks at times. And these kinds of analysis allow for us to get through the figuring out the cost in a way that again is, is appropriate and, and accurate. So here's what we're going to do. We're gonna let's make a deal. You, know, you remember let's make a deal? Who is the head of let's make a deal? Who is the guy that ran it? The old timers in the audience. Monty Hall, that's right. I am now Monty Hall. And you are, you are the people that we're going to make a deal with. You remember how Monty did this? He showed you three doors, right? And he said, now you need to pick a door. I'm going to say you pick door number two. You're just going to have to believe me for now that I did this you know, by chance, but I'm just, just bear with me and let's presume that you as an audience decided you'd pick door number two. Well, what would Monty do next? Now you've picked your door. And this is what Monty would say. He'd show you a, a, the other door. He'd open up one of the doors and say, um, behind door number one is a vial of outdated heparin. Remember, you're going for that million dollars worth of free IV or Gatraban. And then Marty asks you the key question, should you switch or should you stay? And this one I'm going to ask for a, I'm a show of hands, but here's going to be my question. Should, I'm going to first ask, should you stay? Second, I'm going to ask, should you switch? Or third, I'm going to ask, your comment's going to be, it makes no difference at all. It's totally 
equal as to which the odds are the same regardless of which door I choose. So how many say the odds are better of getting the million dollars worth of our Gatra ban by staying? Raise your hand if you think the odds are better for staying. Okay, some hands. How many say the odds are better for switching? A few more hands. How many say that the odds are totally equal? Okay, the majority of you said there's actually no difference, still equal. Well, would you agree this is sort of what it looked like to begin with? You know, switch doors, a third of the chance you guessed right, two-thirds you guessed wrong. If, if you don't switch doors, same thing. Well, in fact, you're better off switching. The odds are in favor you should switch doors. All of those years when Monty Hall did his show, Let's Make a Deal, whenever those, pay, those, those uh, the audience participants were asked, should you switch or stay, they always should have switched. The odds would have been in their favor. Now, if I would end it there, you'd all be chasing me out the door because you're all thinking that doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to walk through and show you why that's the case. So here's what these doors look like. So let's say you picked door number two like we did. Then Monty showed you this door, which meant you switched to the right door. So that's in favor of switching. One in favor of switching. Another scenario, you picked door number one. Monty shows you door number two. You switch to the right door. And then finally, the, so t two times now, you're, you're better off switching. But the last time... You pick the right door to begin with. You're shown either one of the doors, and now you lose because you had initially picked it, and you switched, and you lost. But two-thirds of the time, you're better off switching. And with that, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk.